Welcome to the Impact Lounge. You are in the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. Real quick, before we get started, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so that you subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button so that everybody knows how fire you think this content is. And hit the notifications bell so that you get a notification each and every time we drop some more fire content on this page. This is the Cool Factor Podcast. I'm your host, T.W., and I'm going to, you know, be your guide through the ups and downs of the wavy waters that are Impact Wrestling today, because you never know what type of news you're going to get. You never know what type of show you're going to get. Sometimes it's very exciting and news-filled, and sometimes you got to sit there and sift through the weeds to figure out what they're trying to show you, what they're trying to tell you, what they're trying to give you. So let's not bury the lead here. This week, the number one thing that people are talking about is fans returning post Slammiversary. So we had already gotten the announcement that fans would be at Slammiversary. They would be allowing a limited number of fans inside of Skyway Studios for Slammiversary. And obviously, that's a big deal. You know, it's, it's great for the wrestlers. But... We got the news this week that fans will be allowed at the shows post Slammiversary. So that tells me that fans are back for good. Um, I guess it's going to depend on what type of, you know, turnout they get. You know, if they get 10 people to show up, you know, that's not going to be a very good look. But Impact Wrestling sorely needs to, to get that infusion of energy for their show that would come from having live fans in the audience. Now, look, they're already just super far behind. I mean, even when WWE went to the Thunderdome setup, they were adding virtual fans and it was still piped in crowd noise, but it made it feel more live. It made it feel, you know, like there were people in 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 the building. Um it, it didn't it didn't so much necessarily feel like there were people in the building, but it just reminded you, right? that fans are here and fans are watching and that fans are a part of this show. And AEW, you know, look, they, you know, had the, first they just had the wrestlers around the ring, which I thought did wonders as opposed to having nobody around the ring at all. Um, I thought Impact could have been doing that for a long time. They did it with the uh, Josh Alexander versus TJP Ironman match. And again, it helped out a lot. And I thought that's something they could have been doing to add a little a little noise to the show for a long time. But we are getting fans at Slammiversary, and they've opened up ticket packages for two tapings on the Sunday and Monday following Slammiversary. So I'm interested to see how it how it goes. You know, I hope that there will be a good turnout of fans. I hope they make the show feel fun and energetic and exciting. And I hope Impact gives them something to cheer about. Another big story that people have been talking about this week in regard to Impact Wrestling is they reportedly drew their lowest rating in the history of being on Access TV this week. They uh, allegedly, according to one report, did 69,000 viewers total on Access TV this week. Now, I'm not somebody who puts a lot of stock into ratings. I don't know if you guys really know how ratings work, but pretty much, there's a certain company uh, called Nielsen that has um, specific boxes in certain people's homes. And they, they have to like press a button on the remote to let Nielsen know that they're watching certain things at certain times. And to me, it just seems like a, um, a data collection process that has a lot of variables and a lot of room for error. And I just can't look at that and say, can't think to myself that this is an accurate measure of how, uh, of who's watching what and when. I just, I just, I, I don't think it's necessarily accurate. Um, that said, I don't know if, if the ratings that it's collecting is accurate, but I do think that there's something to be said for the ratings numbers that come in, right? Like, again, the way it's supposed to work is there's people who have these boxes and they signify that they're watching certain things. And then that number gets extrapolated out to be representative of the entire population. 
I don't know. I, 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 I don't think that's accurate. But regardless, if that number is coming in super low, even if it is inaccurate, right? Like it still indicates that the number is lower. So like if it's telling us that it's 69,000 when in reality it could really be 100,000, that still that that still means that it's significantly lower than it normally would be. And I have my theory for why these numbers are coming in lower. Look, I, I mean, was was there an NBA playoff game? It might have been NBA playoffs, could have been some sports. But the number one thing that I think is, you know, Impact has not really capitalized on having Kenny Omega. And when I say capitalized on having Kenny Omega, I don't mean that Kenny Omega is or isn't a draw. That's, that's a conversation for later. But they got more eyeballs when Kenny Omega came over to the show and they didn't do anything to make the curiosity looks stay and keep watching. That's their fault. That's their problem. And again, AEW has full stands at Daly's Place. WWE has no fans, but full screens with the Thunderdome. It looks lively. You know, it's well lit. And then Impact, you know, piped in crowd noise with nobody at ringside. It's just, it's, it's not a good look. It looks like a below standard product. Um, the storytelling is excellent, but the, the presentation does not look like it's as big or as important as the other two big promotions. And so I think if you're Impact Wrestling, you got to look in the mirror right there. Um, you know, was there an era that... Uh, that, that caused the show to not get recorded by DVR and that caused it to not show up on people's guide and so maybe they didn't see it. Maybe, maybe, but regardless of all of that, you should still be pulling in more viewers. Now, again, I don't know how many people have access TV, um, but this is an impact problem. Like, impact is not growing the audience. People talk more about impact when they wanted to complain that the Impact AEW relationship was not even. And since that has died down, people aren't really talking about Impact anymore. I mean, the same people who would be talking about it otherwise are still talking about it. Like people like me who cover the show every week, still talking about it. Um, you know, people who are fans of certain wrestlers on the show, still talking about it. But for the most part, the conversation around Impact has died down significantly. Now it's mostly about when is Kenny Omega going to drop the belt and who will it be dropped to, which is, I think, a, a fine storyline, but it's lost a lot of steam. It's lost a lot of steam because he appears to be just kind of running through the Impact roster, and I think that storyline is, is wearing on people. People figure he's going to drop the belt at some point, but the interest is not there right now into seeing exactly who it's going to be. So Impact has to do a better job of making this show feel like a big deal, making it feel like it's important, making it feel like it's something that people watch and are talking about. Impact has to do better on selling people that this is a lively product, that it's worth their time investing in, and that it's something they can talk to their friends about and not get laughed at. On the show this week, W. Morrissey continued his war on friendship. Um, by getting involved between Eddie Edwards and Kojima. Kojima and Eddie were scheduled to face each other in a nice little friendly exhibition this week. Kojima came to the ring first. He's there waiting on Eddie. Eddie's music plays, but he's nowhere to be found. And of course, W. Morrissey appears up on the screen telling him, you think he's your friend? You think he has your back? Where were you? When I laid him out in the parking lot, so, something, something to that effect. And um, then Brian Myers and Sam Bill come out and Brian Myers basically tells Kojima, you know, hey, I know there's a little language barrier. You don't quite understand everything, but you should just get out of the ring because I got some business to handle. And then Myers proceeds to call out Jake something, but Kojima didn't really appreciate being brushed aside by Brian Myers in that way. So Kojima attacks Brian Myers while he's in the middle of calling out Jake something. And Jake something still comes out. 
He heard his name, so he came out. And it, it, it erupts into a brawl, which turns into a tag team match. You got Jake something and Kojima against Sam Bill and Brian Myers. This is a fun match. These guys, uh, you know, knocked each other around a lot. Good stuff here. The finish came when uh, Jake something intercepted Brian Myers as he was running across the ring to hit Kojima with the roster cut. Uh, Jake something basically caught him as he was running across the ring and got him into a sit-down sidewalk slam. That's, that's a really cool-looking move. I, I like it. I'm not sure what he calls it, but um, it was good. It was, it was, that was a good finish to the match. And, um, yeah, I'm sure we're going to get more and more out of, uh, out, of, out, of, out of Jake something versus, um, God, why do I keep wanting to say Bradley Bill? Am I just thinking about basketball? <laughs> Jake something versus uh, Sam Bill with Brian Myers. Um, later in the show, you, you'll, you'll hear more about the Jake something Brian Myers situation as it, as they're going forward. All right, backstage, we got Gia Miller asking Scott Demore how it's going, having Tommy Dreamer basically overseeing Impact as a consultant from Anthem. Um, before he could really get into it too much, Rosemary and Havoc teleported into the shot, and they basically decided to tell Scott that they want a shot at the tag team titles. And he's like, all right, you know, I'll take it under advisement. Um, go back to the ring. We get Tennille Dashwood versus Rachel Ellering with Jazz in her corner. This is a good match, a little back and forth. Listen, I got to say, I'm impressed with Rachel Ellering. I just look at her as being very new. Um, and so I'm just not quite what to what, not quite sure what to expect every time I see her in the ring. But she's been impressing me. She's been impressing me more and more. And I'm thinking that going forward, she's going to be a solid member of, of the Knockouts roster. Um, the finish to the match came. Rachel Ellering beat Tennille with a roll-up. Tennille attacks Rachel after the match. Uh, you know, she's beating her down. And Jazz jumps, jumps in to make the save. And... Uh, Tennille turns to, you know, start attacking Jazz. That's when Jordan's music hit. Jordan runs down for the save. She clears the ring of Tennille and, and Caleb with a K. And then Rachel extends her hand out to uh, Jordan Grace. And this is one of those times when obviously it would have been great to have an audience there. And Jordan slaps Rachel's hand away. But then she brings her in for the big hug. So they have a, a big hug together, you know, signaling a reconciliation. And they even went as far to further this on social media. If you look at Jordan Grace's Twitter account, she posted some pictures of her, Rachel Ellering, you know, hugging, holding up the Knockouts Tag Team titles. There's a picture of the two of them uh, wearing matching cow pajamas. It was, it was cool. It was cool stuff. But really... It's just to continue furthering the storyline because it looks like all is well, right? It looks like they're happy and, and friendly, but if you know wrestling, that just pretty much guarantees that, that Jordan is going to turn on Rachel in a bad, bad way, and she's probably going to really beat her down, probably. Yeah, she's probably going to beat down Jazz, too, when it happens. So good for Jordan Grace. I'm looking forward to seeing this happen. Um, I've really been looking for some good character development out of Jordan Grace. We know she can wrestle. We know she's in phenomenal shape, but you need that character, right? You need that character. You got to make me love you or hate you, want to see you win, or want to see you get your butt kicked, and we're starting to develop some of that with Jordan Grace. Swig of water for your favorite podcaster. <clears throat> Backstage, Gia Miller asked Chris Bay about how he is staying neutral in the all-out war taking place in the X Division right now. Uh, they get interrupted by the bad guys on this side. It was Rohit Raju, Shira, uh, Ace Austin, and Madman Fulton. Chris Bay tells him, hey, if you're trying to recruit me, I'm good. He said, I'm Gucci. I'm straight. And they tell him, hey, we're not trying to recruit you. We just want you to know. Stay out of our way before you get ripped in half. And before he gets ready to leave, Bay kind of, uh, and, and, and they, they get ready to leave. Basically, they threaten Chris Bay, right? And tell him, look, man, we don't need you. But you just should know we're the muscle around here, right? 
As Chris Bay's getting ready to leave, he tells Gia Miller, why are you always instigating? All right, so I like that. I like that. I like that. He tried to put it on her like she was the one starting the fight. So that was good, right? A little bit of a little bit of foreshadowing. If you think back to the previous week, they were uh, the the good guys, um, PB Williams and uh, and Trey Miguel were basically telling them, "Hey, man, look, you better choose a side before a, ch- a side gets chosen for you, or before a side chooses you." And it looks like a side might have already chosen Chris Bay. So we're going to get more on this as the show goes on. Um, TJP and Follow Bob versus Rich Swan and Willie Mack. Now, this felt like a very slow-moving show, but I got to tell you, when I saw this match coming to the ring, I was like, yo, this is going to be good. This is going to be, I was like, I said, if nothing else on this show is good, this is going to be good. And it started off that way, right? The good good chain wrestling in the ring, you know, a little bit of back and forth. Not sure exactly what's going to happen. There's a part where everybody kind of ends up outside of the ring. Rich Swan jumps up on the rope. Does a, a a phoenix splashy twisty divey thing down on everybody? I'm like, oh man, this is gonna be good. And of course, Violet by Design comes down, interrupts the match, attacks everybody, beats everybody down, and I kind of like it. I kind of like it. Um, you know, as we've talked about plenty of times, Impact's tag division division. What's wrong with me today? Um, Impact's tag division needs work right it needs teams that we actually care about and if you got to put together teams of singles wrestlers that we care about in order to give us tag teams that we'll care about i'll take it okay i'll take it and they've actually done that tjp and follow ba they have receipts as a tag team they've been wrestling as a tag team and we know they can work as a tag team we also know that you know as tjp said in swingers palace he's been putting on bangers for the last you know three four five six months uh, even without follow Ba <clears throat> and Rich Swan is coming off a title run. So we know all these guys can go together. Um, <clears throat> we know Rich Swan and Willie Mack work well as a tag team. And so I like the idea of not blowing off this as one match on impact. Give us some build. So now what we've got an opportunity to do here is see some sort of program build between Violent by Design, Swan and Mac, and TJP and Follow Bob. By the way, I think TJP and Follow Bob should have been tag team champions a long time ago. TJP is one of the best wrestlers in the world. I don't care. Uh, he just is. And Follow Bob is also really good. And you put those two together, they just have, they have great chemistry. I, you know, I would have no problem seeing those guys as tag team champs. I think it'd be fun. And um, you know, I think that when the people come back into the building, those excellent wrestler types are going to just take it up to another level. And, and I think Impact Wrestling has a chance to get injected with a lot of juice in the upcoming weeks here. All right. Backstage, we saw Fire and Flavor upset that Rosemary and Havoc are asking for a title shot. So they find Scott Demore and they corner him about it. You know, they, they, they press him. And Scott Demore basically tells them that Rosemary and Havoc are going to be in a tag team match next week. It's going to kind of be a little bit of a, a qualifier for a tag team uh, title match. And at first, I wasn't quite sure exactly what he was saying. I realized later that he was saying that um, Rosemary and Havoc would have a tag team qualifier against Sue Young and uh, Kimberly. But at the moment, it sounded like he was, I, I, I was thinking, I, maybe I wasn't listening, but I thought he was trying to say they were going to face fire and flavor. And I was like, well, where's the suspense, right? Like you beat them and then you get another shot. Like where, you know, like, like what is that? But I was wrong. It's going to be Kimberly and, uh, and, um, and Susan against Havoc and Rosemary next week. And I guess the winner of that will go on to face fire and flavor. All right. We saw Tommy Dreamer. And his team for the six man that would be Moose, uh, Chris Saban, and Sammy Callahan. They're having an interview. They're all you know talking trash to each other. Basically, they all hate each other, right? Moose is you know he hates everybody. He doesn't want to work with anybody. You know, Chris Saban is like, hey, let's stay on the same page. But Moose, I hate you because we're gonna fight at Slammiversary. And Sammy Callahan hates everybody, but he just wants to get his hand on 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 uh, the, the, who's this guy? Kenny Omega. Right? We got it. Okay, boom. Um, 
Next, we got Chris Bay versus P.D. Williams. And Chris Bay beat him with the uh, the Art of Finesse, which is a, a springboard cutter. Then Ace, Fulton, Rohit, and Shara, they come out. They, they, they start to beat down P.D. Williams. Chris Bay finds his way out of the ring. And as he's doing that, Josh Alexander and Trey Miguel come down to the ring. <clears throat> Chris Bay is up the ramp, getting ready to leave. And then we see that the bad guys start to overcome Josh Alexander and Trey Miguel. Then Chris Bay turns around, comes back to the ring, jumps off with a drop kick to, uh, I think it was Fulton, and basically helps clear the ring of the bad guys. Ace Austin left in the ring all by himself. Josh Alexander and Chris Bay pick Ace Austin up and toss him out of the ring on top of all the rest of the bad guys. Now, I love this. I love the idea of turning Chris Bay into a baby face. Get it? A baby face? A B-E-Y B face? All right. uh, I love the idea of Chris Bay as a baby face. Listen, I think Chris Bay has all the tools to be a mega super duper star. I've, I've said this many times. I think Chris Bay is the, the next AJ Styles in Impact Wrestling if they decide to make him that. He has all the tools. And, and you know, if he's got to be a good guy to get that fan base up, I'm all for it. So the other side of this that I don't like is I don't love the idea of Josh Alexander getting lost in the shuffle. This is not, I repeat, this is not how you build him up to be the one to beat Kenny Omega. Backstage, we see Kimberly and Susan. And by the way, the way that they shot this, I really like this. This was the old, uh, I'd say like 2010 impact where they would you would see the camera kind of peeking around the corner like you're overhearing a conversation. That's the way they, they shot this, this little segment right here. And you saw Kimberly and Susan talking to each other and, you know, they're basically going back and forth. Kimberly's like, hey, we can still be knockout tag team champions and... She's like, uh, she tells, she tells Susan, hey, if it doesn't work out, we still have one last resort. And Susan says, what's that? And Kimberly says, Sue Young. And Susan says, who's that? So apparently Susan is still suffering from schizophrenia or whatever it is because she doesn't know she's Sue Young. Fine. We'll see how this goes. Um, then we see Jake something. Catching us up on, you know, the fallout from his his beef with Brian Myers. He cuts a promo backstage, you know, basically saying that he's insulted that Brian Myers called him unprofessional. And he challenges Brian Myers to a match. Says that if Myers wins, Jake will tell him that he's the most professional wrestler. And if Jake wins, Myers has to acknowledge him. Acknowledge him as a professional. Um... If this is not the dumbest stipulation I've ever heard of a match, I don't know what is. But apparently they're going to a fight over acknowledging that each other is a professional. Fine, whatever. Um, then we see Steve Macklin versus Joe Smith. And listen, Steve Macklin, man, I, I don't see anything special. Some people might think he's special. I just, I don't see it. A lot of these guys who come out of WWE claiming they never got their fair shot. And then when they get a shot, you see why WWE never did anything with them. Now, I don't know if there's more to this character. This is a slow build. But right now, I'm not seeing anything special out of Steve Macklin that makes me feel like, um, you know, this guy can be anything more than a, a strong, a strong, somebody you can build up as like a contender but never actually win the top championship. I just, I don't see, I, I don't see like superstar in uh, the Steve Macklin guy. You know, I'm sure he'll be, you know, a fine wrestler, um, but I just, I don't see anything that's like, you know, that you're going to have to go out of your way to, to, to see. All right. Next we get Brian Myers responding. He cuts a promo saying he accepts Jake's challenge. He says he doesn't need to hear from Jake. He doesn't need Jake to tell him that, he is a professional, but he does want his protege, Sam, to hear it so that he knows that all the lessons under the learning tree of Brian Myers are paying off. All right, cool. So we got our match with the stupidest stipulation in the world. All right. 
Our main event was the Good Brothers and Kenny Omega versus Moose, Chris Saban, and Sammy Callahan. The Good Brothers came out first. Uh, Gallows was wearing the TNA title. Anderson was wearing the AEW title. Um, yeah, I, I wonder how that's going over with Tony Khan, by the way. Don Callis comes out wearing the AAA Mega Championship. And then Kenny walks out wearing the Impact World Championship. Um, I... Listen, this is heel heat. It's heel heat, right? Uh, disrespecting the titles like that. It is what it is. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, we got to into this match when Moose, you know, walked out on his team uh, as he's walking up the ramp. Tommy Dreamer tries to stop Moose from walking up the ramp. Don Callis runs up behind Tommy Dreamer and pushes him so that he bumps into Moose. And Moose turns around, lays out Tommy Dreamer. Don Callis runs away like a roach. And um, back in the ring, we see Chris Saban get hit with uh, a couple of Snapdragon suplexes and a magic killer for the 1-2-3. Um, after the match, there was a great shot that I like to, to see here. We see Moose walking up the ramp. He's kind of looking at his teammates in disgust. But he's also looking at Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers celebrating in the ring. And just see Moose just slowly breathing. Like, you know, like just really still very much focused on Kenny Omega. So what they did with that shot was they told us, the audience at home, that Moose is not out of this picture. That Moose is still going to very much be a part of the world title picture. And Moose could still be the one to take the world title from Kenny Omega. So I think that's very interesting. And, I, and, and you know, look, I, I guess that can help us transition to world title watch, right? Because if my plan, which I think they should do, to have Josh Alexander run through all the X Division until he just looks like an unbeatable, unstoppable force, and now he just has to challenge Kenny Omega. That doesn't look like that's happening because they got a war going on in the X Division, and Josh Alexander is basically right in the middle of it. They're not treating him like any type of standout. They are treating Chris Bay like a standout, which I think is great, but that doesn't do anything for the idea of building up Josh Alexander into being a world title challenger. Now, if you compare that to what they did with Moose at the end of the show, they basically told us that Moose is still a part of this part of this program, a part of this plan. And I guess that brings us to Sammy Callahan. Because if we're talking world title watch, Sammy Callahan has the next shot at the world title at Slammiversary. And you know, Impact tweeted a few days ago, they, they, they tweeted, you know, who you got or something to that effect on, you know, in the world title match at Slammiversary. And I tweeted right under them. I think it might have been the first response. I said, there's no suspense here. Obviously, it's going to be Kenny Omega. It's not that I don't think Kenny Omega is ready to drop the Impact title. I've heard Kenny Omega is pretty banged up. Um, I just, you know, look, I like Sammy Callahan. I think Sammy Callahan is an Impact guy. I think of him as a representative of Impact. And I think that he's been great for Impact. You know, Impact put a lot of stake into trying to get the world title onto Tessa Blanchard. And Sammy Callahan was the perfect vehicle to make that happen. Sammy Callahan is a great professional wrestler. Like, this is, there's no way around that. And he's doing a great job in this role. But he has not been made to feel like somebody that's on the level of a Kenny Omega. The only person who has come close to feeling that way was maybe Rich Swan and then maybe Moose. Other than that, nobody has been close. So the only solution that I see there is you either got to bring Moose back, bring Rich Swan back, or you got to continue to build somebody else. And the only person who's even kind of on a roll that could go in that trajectory is Josh Alexander. But again, with Josh Alexander being lost in the shuffle here of the X Division, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we'll just we'll have to see how it goes. Um, this all brings me to another interesting point, which is I think the Kenny Omega thing has kind of jumped the shark. 
Um, that's not to say I don't want to see Kenny Omega on Impact Wrestling anymore. But I just don't think he brings anything special to the table. I don't I don't see him as any sort of excellent attraction. Um, even Kenny Omega on Dynamite, I don't think that the hype of who this man is supposed to be as a performer has lived up to the delivery. You know, I, I don't think that the delivery has been anywhere near the hype. Like, it's just... It's not like he's bad, but these amazing matches that everybody always talked about, like, I'm just, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. Again, this is not to say Kenny Omega is bad, but this man has been talked about as though he is, like, you know, God's gift to wrestling. And I just, I just don't see it, man. I just, I, 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 I mean, he's he's good. He's okay. He's fine. Like, but I, I, I don't need to break an appointment to, to catch a Kenny Omega match. I don't. And I think that's reflective in, you know, the the ratings drop-off. You know, even the people who came over to Impact to see Kenny Omega, they haven't come back, okay? Um, I'm not saying it's time to get that belt off Kenny Omega, but it's time to do something interesting with Kenny Omega other than just, you know, who's going to be the next challenger. You got to do something. It You know, it is to Impact's benefit to say you have Kenny Omega as your world champion, but... Just him being there and, you know, showing up ever so often and doing the bare minimum, I don't think it's really adding anything to the show. So I think Impact needs to get into the business of creating a new star, a big star, to take that title and help the show. And now it's time for the part of the show that I know you love the most because you're the star of the show, all right? You're the star of this part of the show. This is from the comment section. And if you want to get in this part of the show, all you got to do is right here below this video on YouTube, go ahead and drop your name, drop where you're from, and drop a comment. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you think about what we have to say on the show. What we th you know, what you, if you got a question, um, if, you, if you do or don't like our analysis, whatever, go ahead and drop your comments and let us know. And, you know, if you got a good comment, I'll definitely get back to you. So let's see who was in the who's in uh, the from the comment section this week. All right. Now before I really dive into this, let me go ahead and let me address this piece right here off the top. So <clears throat> if you guys recall last week's show, um, I started off by giving my thoughts on the Impact Wrestling representation in the BRP50. The BRP50 is uh, from the Black Wrestling Podcast, which is, you know, extremely talented group of guys, extremely entertaining podcast. You guys definitely go check it out. It's, it's really a, a, a fun listen uh, anytime you, you, you listen to it. It's, it's really great content. They're on YouTube, uh, SoundCloud, you know, anywhere you get your, your podcast content. Um, but they do a, a ranking every year of what they call their top 50 black uh, re black pro wrestlers. Um, and so Impact was well represented on the list. It, like I said, it's a, it's a fun list. Um, and I wanted to talk about, you know, what I thought about, you know, some of the rankings. Like any rankings list, you're going to have some dispute on where people are ranked. You know, most of my comments was I thought it was interesting how, you know, uh, Chris Bay was ranked higher than Rich Swan, being that you know uh, Rich Swan was Impact Champion for a while, and, and and that type of stuff. I think I said I also said that I thought uh, Tasha Steele should have been ranked higher than Kira Hogan, you know, yada 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 yada. And uh, and I believe later in the show, a few minutes later, I was talking about um, Kiera Hogan and Tasha Steels, and I was saying how. I think that Kiara Hogan has come out of her shell so much more since being paired with Tasha Stills, which I think is absolutely undeniable for anybody who actually watches the show. And I was mentioning that I think having Tasha Stills with her has helped so much in part because sometimes it has to be hard being the only black girl in the room and having someone else to make you feel comfortable bringing out that part of your personality has really helped Kiara Hogan's on-screen character. Now, Nothing really controversial or inflammatory there. However, one of the first comments here uh, 
who's you know name i'm not even gonna i'm not even gonna drop drop the name because i don't feel like giving you any type of fame here you guys can jump into the comments and see you know who had what to say but um this person comment commented i had to stop the video halfway through i was uh, about 25 minutes in uh, again with the race remarks sorry it was getting annoying Please move on and find some other obsession other than people's skin color. And so, I mean, to me, to, to, oh, oh, another another comment that was there was, oh, I will not vote in a list made of black wrestlers as I wouldn't vote in a list made of only whites, Asians, etc. There's not such thing as good racism, man. So... <clears throat> I'm going to address this, okay? <clears throat> um, the thoughts and views expressed hereof are mine and mine alone, okay? And do not represent the thoughts and views of the Impact Lounge or uh, anyone else involved with the Impact Lounge. That said, the comments and discussion that I made, again, was nothing that be, could, could be considered uh, political, or inflammatory, or anything of that nature. But simply mentioning that this was a, a list made by uh, a, a group of, um, you know, black podcasters uh, in support of and acknowledgement of black wrestlers who are, you know, who they, they think are doing a good job, that is annoying to you. And pointing out that there is a specific black experience that someone may be having in the wrestling business from the perspective of a black person, you find that annoying? That's a you problem. That's not a me problem. That's not me trying to, uh, you know, spark any sort of racial discussion or anything like that. That's, if you find yourself annoyed by any discussion that there is anything unique about the experiences of anyone who's different from you, that is a you problem. And if you don't want to listen, you are more than welcome to get to stepping. There's plenty of content for you to consume. As a matter of fact, let me let me let me pull that back here, okay? Because this isn't my channel. This is BQ's channel, and I'm not gonna tell you, you know what I mean, to uh, uh to, to 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 get to stepping. Although you can get to stepping, but I will say this. I am not now or ever going to create a safe space for intolerance of, 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 of topics that involve black people. Like, again, if you have a problem hearing something just because it is, it, it involves black people, that's a you problem. And I ain't your guy. Okay. I ain't your guy and nothing that I do now or ever will be me, will involve me. Uh, creating a safe space for you to not hear about black people, okay? Like, if that's something that bothers you, that if the topic is, is centered around black people, that it just makes you uncomfortable, then you're just going to have to be uncomfortable, okay? Because that is what it is. Um, I am who I am. And, um, and, and again, I could see if I was, you know, talking about something controversial or, or, or trying to create some sort of debate here. Um, but that's not even close to what was going on. So, um, so this, this person and anybody else who feels that way, just know in case you're wondering, you know, I, I'm never, ever, ever going to not talk about something because it's, it's black and I'm never, ever, ever going to create a, a safe space for you to have a problem with a conversation about black people. All right. That said, on to the real comments. <clears throat> All right. So, Blue Cider 21 said, although Impact needs more knockouts, I still think they need top main eventers just as much uh, because they're very thin in the main event scene. Another thing is since fans haven't been at the shows for over a year, Impact really doesn't know who is popular with fans and who isn't. I think that's true. I think that's totally true. But I also would, I would also say that I think a lot of that is by design in terms of who's... Listen, this whole idea of a gray area in tweeners 
That's some nonsense that, that WWE made up because Roman Reigns couldn't get over. Okay? Like, WWE came up with this, oh, this guy's so polarizing because they were booing, because fans were booing the people they were presenting as top baby faces, right? Like, fans were booing John Cena. Man, I remember, God, it had to be like, ooh, it had to be like 2011, 20, yeah, it probably, probably around 20, 2010, 2011. And I took my nephews to see uh, SmackDown at the arena in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And it was so much fun, man. Like, John Cena came out, and it was literally, we were just there going, Cena sucks, Cena sucks. And then, you know, the little kids would, 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 would chime in, let's go, Cena. And it organically happened. It was, let's go, Cena, Cena sucks, right? It, it organically happened. And then you see people all around wrestling. You see fans all around wrestling try and duplicate uh, that type of energy, right? But it's tough. You can't just duplicate it. But because you know, you had this competing energy around this one guy, John Cena. WWE had to create this narrative, right? That, oh, it's like a shade of gray. You guys can't really tell who's a good guy, who's a bad guy. Same thing with Roman Reigns, right? They tried so hard to present Roman Reigns as the top babyface for so long. And for five years, five years, people rejected it. And so what did WWE do? They said, oh, no, 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 no. It's shades of gray. It's not necessarily good guys or bad guys. Sometimes they boo, sometimes they cheer. But really, you know, fans don't really know what they're talking about, right? That Listen, that's nonsense. Fans know what they like and fans know what they don't like. And storytellers know who they're presenting as good guys and they know who they're presenting as bad guys. Sometimes the fans accept it and sometimes the fans reject it. But I think if you do a clear enough job telling us who's the good guy and who's the bad guy, then the fans will tell you whether or not they're being received well as a good guy or a bad guy. You know what I mean? Like, it, it is what it is. So, do they know who's, who's you know, over with fans and who isn't yet? No, they probably don't. But they do a good job of telling the story. So, just keep doing a good job telling the stories and the crowd will get... If you're telling the story well, then the, the audience will receive the story you're trying to tell. And they'll tell you whether or not they like it. They'll tell you whether or not they don't. And I think at this point, right, like Impact's concern is not necessarily manipulating the audience reaction so much as it is just getting the reaction back to being part of the show. So thank you for your comment. All right. Guys 28 says, Impact doesn't do a lot of segments outside of the ring like they used to, they should do more of that to make the show more interesting. Sammy isn't on Moose's level, so I doubt the match with him and Omega will be better. Josh, if booked correctly, could be a top champion in Impact, and a match with Josh defeating Omega would be huge. All right, so listen, I, I totally agree with you, man. I think this Josh Alexander thing is the way to go. I think, um, you know, again, I've been saying this forever when it comes to Impact, where's our guys? Right? Where's the guys that Impact fans can look at and say, this is an Impact guy through and through. He's a big star. Maybe you haven't heard of him, but he's a big deal. And I think that by making a star out of Josh Alexander, you will give us a guy like that that we can hang our hat on to, you know, push forward into the future and be the the, the building block for Impact going forward. Uh, the centerpiece for the shows going forward. All right, Blaze guys, thanks for your question. Paul Young says, what I'm hoping for is that the knockouts division gets strengthened with at least a couple of Chelsea Green, Iconics, Ruby Riot, Sienna, etc. coming on board. That would really elevate the division, and then they need to build up some of their younger talent for some more seasoned wrestlers to help elevate the likes of Sam Bill, Jake something, Josh Alexander, Chris Bay, Ace Austin, etc. Uh, would be good. Um, yeah, listen, Impact is definitely in a place where they need to just continuously be building, building, building. But they also need to identify the building blocks, right? The, the people who are going to be the pillars of everything you're trying to do going forward. To me, you know, some of those people you name, right? Chris Bay, Ace Austin, Jake something, Josh Alexander. Like those guys... Those are, look, man, give them more money, right? So they don't got to go work all the indies. So they don't got to give away good product on the indies. So they don't have to risk their health on the indies. And 
so that they feel comfortable going out and repping Impact Wrestling. Um, I've heard Chris Bay uh, basically really wants to elevate Impact Wrestling. And if you're Impact Wrestling, that's something you have to love because most of these people are just in it looking for their big payday from WWE or AEW. So they do need to do a great job of elevating the people they have. And I think the level of talent that they have in that group of guys you just mentioned is enough to carry Impact into the future. I think that's a good enough core, right? The the best core of guys they've had since they had, you know, Christopher Daniels, Frankie Kazarian, AJ Styles, James Storm, that group of people. So um, the, I think they got the people right here, right now. They just need to do a better job of making them feel like a big deal. So when you get a chance to bring in guys from WWE, do that. Get more eyes on the product, but make those Impact guys the stars of the show. All right, Denard Taylor says, I love the Trey Miguel love. And I say those things about him daily. Yeah, Trey Miguel, man, he's he's really dope. He's really, really dope. And, you know, I say this all the time. I just think he sees wrestling in a way that most people don't see it. And a lot of stuff he can do is just really, really next level. So, you know, I'm hoping they plan to, you know, make him a building block, another one of those building blocks going forward. All right, Bold Shades 98 says, with so many heels in the knockouts division and Grace possibly, possibly, possibly turning heel, they don't seem to have a top face like they did with Kylie. I think the heel versus heel can work at times, but Impact has overdone that last year and that is not interesting and it doesn't work, especially with fans coming back. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I totally agree. They're, they're missing a big baby face heel. I, as I mentioned earlier, I like what they're doing with Rachel Ellering. She needs to keep putting matches in the bank, um, keep putting programs in the bank. You know, it's tough because the knockouts roster is very thin. Um, gosh, I, you know, I don't know. Who would be the the rising hill? Whoever I think is going to take that title off of Deanna Perrazzo, I don't know if they're on the roster right now. Taylor Wilde came back for a cup of coffee and has since disappeared. Um, I heard a report that they were bringing in uh, this independent wrestler, Lady Frost. Haven't seen her yet. And, yeah, I mean, the Impact division needs something, man. It needs something. It needs a, a breath of fresh air. All right, thank you for your question. Kruger Child 1428 says, fans will be at tapings after. Oh, we know that already. Thank you, Kruger Child. Denard uh, Taylor, also love Tasha Steele's love. All right, let's see. Carter Inc. says, I don't get the thought process of where they're going with the Kenny Omega world title situation. I just can't see Sammy beating him clean after all the stuff that's going on so far. I'd be happy if Josh beat Kenny at BFG, but Impact have booked him 250-50 so far. I just can't see them putting that rocket on him between now and BFG. Moose is the choice. He looks like a star. He goes like a star. Plus, it looks as though he's just resigned. He's a guy that could believably kill Kenny. He's the guy. Uh, I just don't quite get where Impact is going with him. Let's see. Him challenging Kenny on Impact Plus made no sense. It's way too early and not a big enough show. I just hope he beats Kenny clean at BFG. Um, yeah, Carter, I, I agree with you. I thought it was a bad move to have to do Moose versus Kenny on Impact Plus early. You know, they tried to keep Moose strong by having the Young Bucks interfere in the match to say, like, hey, you know, Moose lost, but there was interference. So if Moose had a, his had a one-on-one -on -one shot, he'd have, you, you know, a, a better chance. But listen, to me, if you look at Moose and you look at Kenny Omega, Moose should kick Kenny Omega's ass 10 times out of 10. I, I just don't, you know, I Moose shouldn't be selling for Kenny Omega the way that Jungle Boy sells for Kenny Omega. It just shouldn't happen. It should not happen. So they can say they kept Moose strong, but I thought Moose just, it just that listen, Moose should be out there killing people. Moose should be out there wiping the floor even with Kenny Omega. Because I believe in real life, Moose would wipe the floor with Kenny Omega. Right. So um, I just I just. I think they took a lot of air out of Moose. Uh, he might still be the guy. And again, based on the way they finished the show this past week, 
they they're telling us visually that Moose is still very much a part of the story. So, you know, I'm interested. I'm interested to see where it's going. And I do think Moose is still part of the story. But, um, you know, listen, like I said, I think that they could stand to make a star out of Josh Alexander uh, to help impact going forward. All right. <clears throat> so last question from Pact Entertainment. Impact hasn't relied too heavily on the Slammiversary teasers this year, but they still definitely have to deliver. They delivered last year, and they know they have to do it again or people will be disappointed. Um, <clears throat> listen, you're right. Uh, you know, Impact, they haven't been showing the Slammiversary, you know, like our world will change everything teasers too much recently. Um, I think with, I think they were probably really banking on Samoa Joe coming back and, um, you know, that's off the table now. And I just, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure that I'm going to be buying Slammiversary. I'm not totally into, uh, Sammy Callahan versus Kenny Omega. I don't think there's any suspense there as to who wins that match. And I keep my 40 bucks in my pocket. You know what I mean? I don't know. They still got a couple of weeks to sell me on it. Um, I do want to see that Ultimate X match. Um, but I don't know if that's enough to sell me on the whole pay-per-view. So I'm kind of interested in what's going to happen. But I, I, I agree. Like, I don't feel like this is the, um, you know, I don't feel like this is a must-see pay-per-view right now. So, you know, like I said, they still got some time. You know, I'm open to being sold on the pay-per-view. But as of right now, I'm not. I think if the pay-per-view was tomorrow, I'd just read about the results because I don't um, I don't feel compelled to buy this particular uh, edition of Slammiversary. So we'll see where that's going. <clears throat> all right, family. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. That's all I got for you this week. Um, again, make sure you like this video. Give us a boost. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification button so you know whenever shows are coming out. Make sure you follow the Impact Lounge. Follow me on Twitter, at TWTalkingBout. Follow uh, my other account, at TalkingBoutPod. Um, we got lots of great stuff coming up for you in the future. Oh, by the way, drop in the comments. Tell me, do any of you guys collect um, action figures, like WWE action figures, or like T-shirts, or you know that type of stuff? Because I might have some cool giveaways for you. I got some friends in high places, and I might have got my hands on some goodies that I can give out to you guys. So um, <clears throat> drop in the comments below, below. Let me know if you'd be interested in you know some wrestling memorabilia type of giveaways. It's not impact centric. A lot of it is uh, kind of WWE centric stuff. But let me know if that's the type of stuff you guys are interested in. If you are, then I, I might have you know a couple little quick contests to do some giveaways for you guys. All right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, I'm your host, TW. I'll talk to you next week. Peace.